Out of these high riverbanks, a murder mystery has emerged. He brought himself up to show us something. A chance discovery unearths a powerful secret. It must have been someone that really got up and really spoke for him and everything because of the wounds and not in him. A peaceful burial belies a violent death. It's clearly a cutting trauma. Dreadful axe wounds on the skull. The injuries are puzzling, as if by a weapon of steel, not stone or wood. It was a very aggressive and hostile attack with the intent of murder, I would say. Aboriginal people want to know if this is a fallen fighter from a frontier war. We're now looking at possibly 50,000 or so Aborigines killed in direct conflict with Europeans. This skeleton raises plenty of questions, but two are crucial. When did this person die? And what was the cause of death? We're following the investigation as it unfolds. Cutting edge technology, piecing the puzzle together. Is this trauma indicative of pre-contact intertribal violence? Or could it possibly be something that occurred during the post-contact era? Can science solve this cold case in time? before Torelli Man is finally laid to rest. This is Barkindji country, the floodplains of the Darling River in northwestern New South Wales. For millennia, it's been the homelands of Badger Bates's people. The river they know as Baka is their lifeblood. To us Barkindji people, us Barka Wimbledon people, us Darling River people, that's our main artery there. This area is now part of the Turali National Park. While walking here in 2012, Barkindji elder Badger Bates made a surprising discovery. I was coming along here and I was looking at these shell middens, see? Up to here. And what'd you see? I seen the skull. Person skull is down in here. He was sort of laying with his head down like and then the mouth was open. To me, he was crying for help because of the mouth, and I, that's why I started to cry and I said, I'll help you. The burial site was stabilised with the help of National Park staff, and excavation began a year later. I'm against people just going around and looking for a skull and digging them up. But when they come up, look at them. We knew there was a massacre here. This person brought himself up to say, I was killed. Help me try and make people understand, you know, that we was here. This is what happened to us. While his skull was sticking out, I think... The community suspects this is a victim of frontier violence, so they offered science a rare opportunity and called in Dr. Michael Westaway, an expert in Aboriginal archaeology. But once the pelvis is, is exposed, we'll be able to work out... Oh, this is a man that is carefully laid to rest by his people. The burial was very complex. His skull, beneath it was a small pillow of well-washed sand. There were leaves associated with the burial. So he hasn't just been disposed of after a, a nasty, violent incident. He's been cared for by his people. And when we came across the remains, they were in a tightly flexed position, almost like a fetal position, with the knees drawn up to the chest. And that is a common burial practice amongst the Barkindji traditionally. But do these remains actually represent those of an individual that was killed during frontier violence? Finding evidence of Aboriginal people killed in frontier wars is rare. Unless they were buried in this way, it's extremely unlikely their remains are preserved. Much of the evidence was simply destroyed. So finding direct evidence of frontier conflict is difficult. Few people know more about Australia's 130 years of frontier warfare than historian Henry Reynolds. It's not as though you're dealing with a European battle where a large number of people were killed in one place and often buried in mass graves. Aborigines were probably killed in a much more scattered way. There has been very, very little attempt to, to, to look at the archaeological record. However, this case is exceptional. 
The Aboriginal community want the remains studied and the skeleton is remarkably well preserved. These sort of rich limes, sort of calcareous sort of deposits, provide really good conditions for the preservation of bone. So it's not an acidic soil, the bone doesn't break down rapidly in this sort of environmental context. You rarely find a complete burial. It's not really like CSI. But this time, they have almost the entire skeleton. When fully excavated, they recovered 204 bones. Only two small bones were missing. The skeleton can be considered as an osteobiography. Each bone has the potential to tell something about this individual's life. The shape of the pelvis reveals that this person was male. This foramen uh, is more angular, which is a male character. The greater sciatic notch is quite tight, which is more of a male character. From the teeth, Michael gets a sense of when this man might have lived. We know that this individual was subsisting on a traditional diet. There is this fairly distinct pattern of clues where there's no evidence of, of holes in the teeth of caries, dental caries. We don't really start to see dental caries in the teeth until the arrival of a European diet rich in flour and, and sugar. From his close reading of the bones, Michael can tell they belong to a healthy, 20-something Aboriginal male who ate a traditional diet and enjoyed a meal of yabbies. It's very rare that you actually see the stomach contents preserved, but in this instance, we found uh, gastroliths from Yabby, so small little gizzard stones uh, that were found within this uh, individual's stomach. A last supper, as it turned out. Despite the careful burial, his death had been horrific. There's evidence of multiple trauma, including rib injuries, as well as savage blows to the skull. I would imagine that the head wound would have caused the death of the person. Michael called on the expertise of one of Australia's foremost forensic anthropologists, Professor Richard Wright. While he finds a 99.6% probability that the skull is an Aboriginal man from this part of Australia, he has a special interest in the injuries. Richard worked on the exploration of mass graves in the Ukraine and in Bosnia, identifying victims of genocide. I had a lot of experience with people who'd been violently killed, so I had a look at the axe marks. It was clearly done in what we call perimortem time, uh, that is, around the time of death, and when the bone was full of collagen. One of the chop marks, the, the piece that came off is hinged off, and that only happens in the case of uh, fresh green bone. But whether it's done with a machete or whether it's done with a steel axe or a stone axe, I don't know. Whether it's a steel or a stone weapon is key to establishing the circumstances of his death. Steel only arrived in Australia with Macassan fishermen in the north and then with European settlement. What is very interesting about this wound is that it seems to represent a sharp edge trauma rather than the shattering of the bone. There appears to be a long cut that extends from the skull and into the cheekbone below the right eye. When you look carefully at these sort of lesions, the striations are fairly diagnostic of an edged steel weapon. So it may actually be evidence for frontier violence. This is significant because we actually haven't seen anything like this in the archaeological record in Australia before. Battles between Europeans and Aborigines occurred throughout Australia, including the Darling. When white settlers penetrated the interior, they were attracted to the fertile river flats. In arid areas like northwestern New South Wales, water was scarce. And so both the Europeans, usually with their cattle, and the Aborigines depended on the same water. So conflict was almost inevitable. But not all their encounters were violent. Major Thomas Mitchell made expeditions here in the 1830s following the course of the Darling River. And we know from his journals that he traded metal weapons with Aboriginal people that he met along the way. For example, he wrote, I gave to one man a piece of my sword blade and to another a tomahawk, which he carefully wrapped in the paper in which I had kept it and he seemed much pleased with his present. 
We certainly know that many European artefacts were traded back beyond the frontier, sometimes uh, long before the Europeans arrived. And there's no reason to suppose that something like a sword may not also have found its way back along Aboriginal trade routes into the interior. The idea that the injuries were caused by a metal blade is an intriguing one. And certainly metal weapons were introduced at the time of European settlement. But in this case, it doesn't necessarily mean it was wielded by a white settler. Determining the age of the skeleton is crucial. If Torelli Man died before the arrival of Europeans, the question of whether the weapon was stone or steel should be solved. Michael has sent bone and tooth samples and the Yabby gastrolith to be carbon dated. Carbon-14 dating won't give us an indication of what decade he died, but it will tell us if it was in the last couple of hundred years. If the date is much earlier, then uh, well, that adds to the confusion. We have to clean the sample to remove any contamination. So for bone, what we're doing is we're extracting the protein component. The protein then needs to be converted into solid graphite for measuring. The whole process, plus analysis with a mass spectrometer, takes some time. So Michael will have to wait a few weeks before he gets the results. Meanwhile, the injuries continue to confound him. There are some biological anthropologists in Australia that have made specific studies of intertribal conflict, and they have extensive databases of what this trauma looks like. Nothing that we've seen with this man seems to sit comfortably with what has already been recorded by archaeologists. So Michael's turned to studies of trauma in other well-documented human populations. Looking at the experiments on bone that have been published in the United States and elsewhere, we can see that edged weapons and swords in particular create traumas very similar to what we're seeing in the man from uh, Torelli. Bizarrely, the skull wounds on Torelli man appear similar to those on gladiators in Imperial Rome. It was curious because one of the heel traumas looks very similar to what is documented in an important case study looking at the remains of gladiators. And it looks like a heel trauma from a sword wound. And, you know, that's puzzling to see that in Torelli Man. It all seems to be suggesting that Torelli Man lived in post-contact time and was murdered by a steel-edged weapon. With the radiocarbon dates now in, will they confirm this hypothesis? The human remains were much, much older than we were expecting. For the bone and for the tooth, we have an age of around 1260 to 1280 AD, um, so much, much earlier than we thought it was going to be. For the gastrolith, we've got an age somewhere in the 1400s to 1600s. I didn't expect the carbon dates to be anything like that. I thought they were going to be very modern, and the carbon dates suggest, no, look, it's 700 years old. Uh, that means that there are weapons being used by people in Western New South Wales that are creating signatures that look like, uh, you know, sword wounds. The radiocarbon dates are a surprise for Badger too. That's yeah, our old people back then did not have a blade like that. If that carbon date is 700 years old, there is something wrong somewhere. While he's glad the remains are being studied, it's now time to rebury them. A new grave is dug a few metres away from the original site. Badger sees good signs they're in the right place. The face there, on the tree up there. Ah. See it? There, look, see it. The pressure is on to determine the weapon that caused the lethal injuries. Looks like he's been in a battle royal, Michael, eh? Yeah, yeah. But there is a way to continue the work, even after burial. Using the latest CT and 3D scanning technology, the skeleton is digitised in high resolution. The combination of both techniques should enable Michael to see inside the bones. There's only so much we can see on the surface. This sort of technology takes us deep inside the remains to understand you know, the extent of the damage that may have been created from that initial impact. 
the scanning of the actual skeleton has been fed into a 3D printer to produce this exact replica of the skull. But the really fine detail is captured in the digital files from the 3D and the CT scans. This sort of information you may not document in the field. By doing 3D scanning, bringing it back, we can now look at the angle of orientation that the blow came from that struck uh, this man in the face. We can take a plane through the top, we can work out the angle of the blade striking. Working out the angle of the strike has helped establish that the cut marks on the skull are likely from the one blow. They are around 170 millimetres in length. So that's a fairly long edge that's created that trauma. And it's the sort of length we'd expect from a sword or a sabre or something like that. Digital images provide a picture of the internal surface of the skull, revealing more about the radiating fracture visible on the surface. That's the internal surface of the frontal bone. Yep. And we can see that there's no sign of that same fracture. So it looks like it hasn't extended into the internal surface of the skull. So it, it looks like it wasn't a really heavy object that created that impact. The scans reinforce the theory that the cuts were made with a long, sharp, light blade. And swords were a feature of frontier weaponry until the late 19th century. Swords would certainly have been carried by early exploring parties in that part of New South Wales. But the idea that these injuries were caused by a steel sword is contradicted by the radiocarbon dating. It showed the man lived and died well before the arrival of Europeans and their weapons. If it is before that, then there is a great mystery. What was a, what was a metal weapon doing in that part of New South Wales? A long way away from the sea. It's really puzzling. What's created such a deeply incised trauma? Uh, something that seems to be mimicking uh, a steel-edged weapon. After all this investigation, Michael is left with a paradox. But there's one more dating test he has yet to try. Optically stimulated luminescence, or OSL, dates sediment, not bone. In this case, it's the sand that filled the skull after burial. Quartz grains trap sunlight, and by dating these individual quartz grains using luminescence dating techniques, you can measure the last time those quartz grains were exposed to sunlight. It's like there's a clock in every sand grain. And when the OSL results come in, they confirm this is not a recent burial. The sand has been in darkness, hidden inside Torelli Man's skull for the last 500 to 700 years. This confirms what the carbon dates are saying. The luminescence age tells us that the soil infilled that skull well before Europeans were in this country. So it really does rule out that this individual was killed by a sword. But what caused the cut marks remains unsolved. Could something made of wood actually be responsible? Weapons like these had a sharp edge and were used as clubs or thrown as missiles. One thing that we don't know is what impacts could hardwood Aboriginal objects have? There have been no experimental studies whatsoever using hardwood Boomerangs made out of really tough timber, like Gigi, with a very sharp edge. But could they really create the damage that we've seen in this man who lived at uh, Turali? We don't really know, uh, because the experiments simply haven't been done. Further analysis of the injuries may continue. But for the Barkindji mob, it's time for this man to be laid to rest again. I made a promise to this person that I'd look after him and I'd come and I told you for where he was. They've gathered for a traditional burial ceremony and invited the scientists and National Park staff. The bones are carefully laid out in the same way they were found. If they treat him with respect and do it like this man is doing it, I don't see a problem with it. After a brief time in a different world, the man they bury leaves behind an enduring mystery and a deeper trust. 
I feel really privileged to have been given the opportunity to study this individual in such detail because it isn't a common occurrence in Australia. That's mean. You go to sleep, my brother. You've been good to us. There's still a lot of sensitivity and a lot of concern among some traditional owners about this sort of research. But in this instance, the work has been driven by the community. I found him. I will put him back in the ground, let him rest in peace, and no one will touch him again. That's the promise I made to him.